University of Ulm. University of Ulm is our, let me say, long-term uh, uh, cooperation partner, more than 30 years. We cooperate with the University of Ulm. And the topic of uh, keynote lecture by Professor Spodrev is prediction of heavy tailed random functions. You are welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, it is my pleasure to give a lecture here. And let me just uh, start trying to share my screen. Um, do you see the second copy of myself? The slides? Yes. Perfect. So um, the topic I'm going to tell you today is about uh, the prediction of uh, some random functions which may possibly have uh, risky tails or uh, as one says, heavy tails. So this is a joint work with one of my PhD students, Abhinav Das, and the postdoc Vitaly Makagon. Well, uh, just to give you uh, an outline of what we are going to do, um, first I will uh, give you a state of the art of the extrapolation. And we'll see that there are some uh, deterministic methods which consider prediction as just approximation. And there are also some stochastic methods such as regression or Krieging but uh, they all require uh, the existence of a variance, so the square integrability of the process. And uh, uh, until recently, there has been no unified framework for extrapolating um, processes or fields with no second moment. For instance, in finance or in insurance, you may have uh, very risky uh, assets and such that the volatility is very high, so you cannot assume the uh, existence of the second moment. So for that, we'll introduce uh, the so-called excursion metric, and we'll see that it coincides with something which was already known in the literature, and it was introduced in the mid-80s, and it was at that time uh, called separation metric but it heavily relies on the um, notion of excursion sets. Uh, then, uh, for a very specific choice of the uh, measure M, which will govern the uh, choice of excursion sets, we'll come to the so-called Gini metric, and uh, uh, we'll study its properties. So we'll uh, assume that our um, Prediction approach is based on the minimization of this Gini metric, actually, or the excursion metric in more generality. And that's why in this uh, particular part of the talk, I will uh, give you an, a glance of what can be this prediction via excursion sets and excursion metric. So the main idea is that actually the excursion sets of the uh, forecast and of the original process must be more or less the same. And uh, just to be uh, more illustrative, I will give you uh, uh, an example of a linear extrapolation of Gaussian random processes and fields which are stationary in time or in space, not because they are heavy tailed, of course they are not, but because they serve as an important benchmark uh, in the theory of geostatistical um, prediction and simulation, and we'll see that there uh, everything works very well. So there, there is an existence and uniqueness of solution, which is given by the second order cone programming. There are some such important properties of uh, forecasts as exactness, uh, weak and almost surely consistency, and so on. And at the end, uh, I will just illustrate this by some simulations and conclude uh, with references. So uh, just to uh, say it in advance, of course, we have also the other uh, examples of uh, successful application of this theory, for instance, to max table 
random processes and fields which are used in extremal value theory or to alpha stable processes and fields and they all are heavy tailed so uh, the gaussian case is really a benchmark well let me start um so let me just briefly introduce you to the uh, uh, problematic of uh, prediction assume we have a stationary random field which is actually a, a random surface in rd um, so with with uh, arguments in rd uh, and uh, we observe it at a certain locations t1 up to tn so i will draw it in 2d so this is my space rd and i have locations t1 uh, t2 and so on tn and i would like to say something about uh, the value x of t which is not observed at a location t so the question is how to do that if uh, x of t uh, is not square integrable so which means the expectation of x square of t is infinite so in one dimension it is possibly more appealing so let me do it in one dimension as well so we have uh, a realization of a random process x which i will give in another color like uh, red something like this and we are interested at predicting its values at uh, a certain location t for instance t is here when we know how the uh, values um, of this function x uh, behave at locations t1 t2 and so on up to say tn so for instance this may be our past this may be our future but uh, if we are talking about extrapolation uh, so this is usually the case uh, for the case of interpolation t would lie somewhere in between so it is also allowed so this is the general framework of extrapolation or interpolation if you wish or prediction and now uh, let us uh, look at what is known up to date so uh, if we say that x is a deterministic function we just uh, see it like this then of course we have uh, the possibility uh, to uh, do deterministic extrapolation and there are many possibilities like the triangulation of a surface like splines of all possible kinds radial extrapolation even reproducing kernel hilbert spaces and so on and so on so this list is not exhaustive but now uh, so let us come uh, to the list of methods which say that x is random and there for processes for instance which are stationary in time uh, there is a, a classical book of Rosanov from the 60s where the spectral L2 theory is given. So, uh, and it is based on the existence of the spectral density, and which means that there is a finite second moment. So, here we have finite uh, variance. Uh, there is yet another possibility via regression, which means we consider the prediction to be the um, um, conditional expectation provided that we know the observed values. And uh, for some cases like Gaussian and some alpha stable cases, it is known that this regression is even linear. But uh, apart from those cases, the nonlinear regression is quite difficult to apply because it has many uh, theoretical obstacles. And there is yet another very uh, well known and uh, used in geostatistics at least method which is uh, 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 called Krieging and uh, the name goes back to a German uh, geologist which was working in Africa in the 50s Daniel Krieger but actually uh, it was uh, in its essentials given by uh, earlier papers of Kolmogorov in the 40s and was developed up to its present state in uh, the uh, school of mining of Georges Materon in the 60s. 
So the main idea is the following. We are looking at a linear prediction, which means that we take the linear combination of known values with unknown weights, lambda j, and this vector of weights has to be found from this particular minimization problem. So we minimize the square uh, distance between the unknown value and the predictor, uh, given that uh, the mean is preserved. And the, pre uh, the mean is preserved uh, looks as follows. It is just the sum of lambdas equals one due to the linearity of expectation. Um, so this is what is called ordinary creaking. The idea is very simple. The realization is just a solution of a very easy uh, system of linear equations. And uh, if we forget about this, then it is called simple creaking, and it even coincides, coincides with linear regression for Gaussian processes. But again, the problem is we need the finiteness of tails, uh, of, 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 uh, of the variance. So if there is no finite variance, the situation is very uh, ugly. So there is no unified framework and there, uh, there exists some specific approaches which are tailored to some very specific uh, classes of random processes. For instance, for alpha stable random fields and uh, time series, there are some papers which consider different uh, heaviness uh, of the tails parameter alpha to be between zero and one equals one and from one to two. Uh, and I was involved with some of those papers. Uh, and there is a more uh, general framework, which is called conditional simulation. It is even given for max table uh, random processes, but it is very uh, computationally intensive. And conditional simulation means that you simulate your process, but uh, on, um, conditioned that the observations uh, which are given uh, are, are preserved. So the, the, the um, surface goes through these observations. And very recently, so uh, actually one year ago, uh, we proposed uh, a new framework, which is very general, and it works also for um, uh, square integral random functions, but also for uh, heavy tailed ones. Um, it is based on level sets, and it can be also law preserving, which is actually a very uh, good advantage of uh, conditional simulation. So uh, being law preserving is uh, certainly good. And if we go back, say, to, uh, um, to uh, the last slide and to compare uh, the creaking one, then you see that here, for instance, the prediction cannot be law preserving because the variance will be different. So the variance of the predictor will be minimal and it will not be equal to the variance of the original state. So this is a certain drawback of Kolmogorov's theory, but it can be uh, overcome. Well, uh, how it works? Let me just give you a, a brief idea of how it can be done. So assume that we have the one dimensional case. So again, I have a certain uh, realization of a random process. For instance, it goes like this. Um, and then what I do, I choose certain a certain number of level sets, of, of levels, better to say, like this. And these levels, which I will denote by U, are governed by a certain measure, MDU. So uh, it is finite, and without loss of generality, we may consider it to be a probability measure. So now we are looking at the level sets, which means uh, it is the proportion of uh, our realization lying above the level. So for instance, for this particular level, so this will be these intervals, the, the first one, the second one, the third one, and so on. And we are taking the um, uh, joint, the overall length of these intervals at each level. Now let us consider a prediction. The prediction will be given in a different color, say magenta. 
And the prediction will be not necessarily exactly the same process as it is, but it will be in a sense similar. And then we take the level sets of this predictor as well. And we see that there is a, a small discrepancy between the level sets of the original process and this one. And I will put it in magenta as well. For instance, uh, this one and this one. And again, here, this one and that one and so on. Uh, so this uh, discrepancy will be measured by the, the symmetric difference of the corresponding level sets. And then if we take their overall length and the expectation we have is the, so, the so-called um, error in measure, which can be minimized. And minimizing this, we achieve that the prediction is as close to the original process as it can be. And for this, we need no um, moment assumption at all. Now, uh, to be more specific, let me introduce one metric which will formalize this. And this is called uh, the excursion metric. So now assume that uh, we have a level U, which will be an excursion level. And it is chosen according to this finite measure, which we assume to be a probability measure, because if it is just finite, it will cause only the multiplication by a constant in all integrals. And the excursion pseudometric, so it is not still a metric, but a pseudometric, is introduced as follows. This is an integral of the probability of the symmetric difference of these two events. Uh, for now, it looks a bit different from what I was telling before, but you'll see that after a Fubini argument, it will be the same. So if M is probability measure and this probability is uh, between zero and one, it is clear that this metric lies between zero and one, pseudometric. Um, so, but um, it is uh, interesting to see that um, actually this metric introduced so far coincides with the so-called separation pseudometric, which is introduced by Taylor in uh, 19, um, 84, and it was given this way. So this is the minimum of the two random variables, and this is the maximum. So U is the uh, uh, random level with this uh, probability measure M. And uh, so U must lie between the minimum and the maximum of the two random variables. So actually, these two quantities are the same. And we were surprised by uh, seeing that we were the first persons citing the paper of this uh, Mr. Taylor from the 80s. So he had zero citations up to, up to date. So it was a kind of uh, a discovery feeling, so to say. Well, um, now let me come back to the intuition behind the prediction of uh, uh, random functions. For the moment, let us assume that our random functions are infinitely divisible, which means if we take a linear combination of random values which are observed, we have a chance that the predictor has the very same um, law as the uh, field X. So otherwise, if we do not have infinite divisibility, this may be not the case. So now we formally introduce the excursion sets of the original process and of the predictor. And we also introduce the error in measure, which is the following. We take the uh, total uh, length of the symmetric difference between uh, the level sets of the original X and the predictor. And just to remind you what is the uh, uh, symmetric difference, if you have two sets, A and B, uh, which intersect possibly the symmetric difference will be the parts of the uh, uh, sets which are uh, not common, so without the intersection. So uh, we take the, uh, the uh, joint length of this symmetric difference, its mean, and we al also integrate over all possible levels. Um, by Fubini argument, it is the same as doing the following. So 
here we had a certain observation window W. And then we can integrate over the observation window our excursion metric, which was introduced before. So this is nothing else but uh, the uh, change of uh, integrals by Fubini. And one more uh, uh, interesting uh, condition which we have to impose is that we have uh, the exactness in law. So the predictor must be distributed exactly as the observed value. So now just to study some uh, properties of this metric, and I will do it very briefly, actually this pseudo metric, first of all, um, can be given as the expectation between the, uh, of the absolute value of the difference between these uh, left-hand side limits of the distribution function of the random level u. And if we assume that the uh, distribution function fu, which is a CDF of our measure m, if it is continuous, then uh, it, it becomes the usual uh, L1 distance between these two random variables, which by the way are bounded. So they are between zero and one, right? And this makes the problem tractable very much and the expectations always exist. And if this measure M is absolutely continuous and has a density, then of course we can uh, um, write this expectation this way. This is the first lemma which was proven independently by us as well, but uh, Taylor was the first who was giving this, that's why we cite him. And then uh, we uh, prove the theorem, when does this uh, pseudometric become a metric? And we'll do it in a certain different setting as Taylor, but still he was giving a similar result, which why, that's why we, we, we cite him as well. We assume that we have the space of random variables with the same support S. It may be the whole uh, R, but it can be also a certain sub-interval. And if we assume that the distribution function Fu is strictly increasing on the support, then our excursion submetric becomes a real metric. So the main difficulty was, of course, that if two uh, um, random variables have the submetric equals to zero, from that it would not follow that they are uh, different. And uh, under this specific assumption, it is uh, the case, and so we have a metric. So now, indeed, uh, for the uh, remaining part of our talk, we'll assume that we have the situation, so all uh, random variables have the same support. And we will also need uh, for two random variables, y1 and y2, which are absolutely continuous with a certain support s, uh, distribution functions and f1 and n2, we also need a copula c. For those of you who uh, have forgotten what is a copula, so the copula is a, a construction which was proposed by Sklar in one of his papers in the 50s. And it says that the copula is just the marginal free uh, bivariate distribution of uh, the vector. So if we say that, uh, so this is x1 and this is x2. So the uh, distribution function of this vector y1, y2 can be written as a copula uh, evaluated at uh, univariate CDFs F1 and F2. So this is essentially what we'll need. I do not give a formal definition, I'll just explain what, what is the sense of this. So C will be the copula of those variables Y1 and Y2. And then uh, the uh, next question is, so, so far we had a, um, no specific choice of M. So how to choose M? M was the uh, probability distribution of our excursion level uh, u. So how to choose excursion levels? Of course, if you say, uh, uh, take uh, u, which is not concentrated on the support of y1 and y2, you'll just get zero, which means the distribution of u has something to do with the support of these variables y1 and y2. But for, 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 the, uh, for the moment, let us just uh, think what is the maximal possible choice. 
which measure maximizes this particular um, excursion metric. And it appears to be uh, just an atomic measure, which is concentrated at a certain U star, which can be uh, given this way. And it depends on the marginals of, of Y1 and Y2 and on their copula. And if additionally, we assume that the two Y1 and Y2 are the same in distribution, then even we can um, say that it depends only on the copula this way, which means um, taking M to be the maximum, uh, a measure which maximizes uh, the metric is not informative. It is much more informative, say, to take uh, the uh, levels U to be distributed according to one of those variables, say, uh, according to the distribution of, of the first one, Y1. If we do it like this, then indeed, uh, we can have a very uh, nice simplification of how this metric can be written down. So we have here two expectations of the distribution F1 of the maxima between Y1 and Y2 minus the expectation of F1 of Y2 minus, and this is nothing else, but the expectation of F1 of Y1. But you know that if we have the very same distribution F1 of Y1, then this is a uniform distributed random variable on zero one. That's why we have the expectation one half. So, and if additionally, we assume that both uh, random variables have the very same distribution and it is uh, taken as the a distribution of excursions, then we may even uh, have a more uh, convenient form. And this is just two expectations of the maxima of the transformed random variables minus one. And since the diagonal of the copula is uh, connected to this maximum the, this way, we can even say that our excursion metric is now equal to this particular quantity, which is nothing else but a linear combination of an integral of the diagonal of the copula. And now if you uh, go back to econometrics and you uh, compare this to the expression of the so-called Gini coefficient, um, the Gini coefficient was a certain concentration measure uh, uh, saying what is the concentration of common wealth in uh, a state, for instance. And if we assume that this is a Lorentz curve, for instance, if it is convex, then indeed this particular quantity is the Gini coefficient. Let me just give you a short uh, um, illustration. So this will be the diagonal of our copula. This is zero, this is one, and this is the uh, linear function y equals x. So this is x, this is c of x, x. And so the Gini coefficient was this particular uh, area measuring the deviation of the uh, Lorentz curve from the uh, line of perfect equality in econometrics, saying what is the perfect distribution of goods in a society. So, uh, but in our case, C, which is the diagonal of the copula, must not be convex. That's, that's uh, mean we have not a perfect coincidence with the Gini coefficient, but inspired by this, we can give the following definition. So if we consider the space of random variables, which are absolutely continuous and have this CDF, then the metric, the excursion metric, which takes our levels from the very same CDF and which is given this way, will be called the Gini metric. And for the Gini metric, we have very nice properties. For instance, it is bounded by one half from above. And the value of one half is given exactly when we have a complete dependence, which means y2 is a certain non-decreasing function of y1, satisfying some additional condition. And this is good news. So now let us return to our problem of prediction. Suppose we have a random variable x. So, so far, no random functions, just random variables. And we have some set of realizations of X, and we would like to pre predict the value of X according to these realizations. The predictor can be whatever measurable function, which is in some sort uh, continuous on Lambda. Um, 
for instance, for infinite divisible X, it can be the linear combination. For max stable X, it can be the maximum and so on. So depending on the class of random variables which you consider. Then uh, we will um, uh, do the following. We'll minimize the uh, excursion metric uh, with respect to lambda such that uh, they satisfy the additional constraint that the predictor is equal in distribution to the original X. So uh, this is the sense of the law preserving prediction. So here in this case, uh, our metric will coincide with the Gini metric and our uh, extrapolation or prediction problem writes like this. So we have the integral of the diagonal between the uh, uh, X and its uh, predictor, we integrate it and it must be maximized. So C is again the copula of this vector. And the constraint, the law preserving constraint may be written down as follows. So we apply F to uh, uh, our predictor and it is equal to this value, which is uniformly on zero one, uniformly distributed. But, uh, uh, so it is very nice doing this in theory, but if you would like to do uh, practical calculations with this, you will face copula estimation, which is not a simple task. That's why we would like to avoid it and do it as follows. Uh, we will return to the original form of the excursion metric of this particular type and say they will just minimize the excursion metric if we do not impose this constraint, and if we uh, would like that our prediction is law preserving, we may even include this into the constraints into lambda and minimize this particular part, which is a very easy expectation. And it always exists because F is a CDF lying between zero and one. So we have expectations uh, which always exist. And this will be exactly what we will be doing later on. But now the question is, what if the constraint of this type is analytically not tractable? You will see, for instance, in the Gaussian case, this constraint can be easily written down. And it is just uh, the, um, um, it is the uh, system of two uh, equations. One of them is quadratic and another one is linear. But for instance, in the max table or in alpha stable case, these are co relatively complex manifolds, uh, which, are, which can be written down, but it is difficult to, to handle them analytically. That's why uh, we can avoid this by taking uh, another metric rho, which measures the uh, distance between the margin distributions of two random variables. The first one is uh, fx applied to our predictor, and the second one is fx of x. So this can be any metric, but for convenience, we'll take the two Wasserstein distance, which can be written down in one of its forms as follows. It is just the L2 distance between the quantile functions. Um, and of course, if y2 is fx of x, and this is, uh, uniformly distributed on zero one, so this particular uh, um, random variable, then the quantile is linear. And then we have a very nice, so, uh, so this will be just X and we'll can integrate it. And we'll have a very nice uh, representation of uh, the squared um, Wasserstein distance. So actually I can put our square here as well. This will be one third plus the second moment of an independent copy of Y minus the expectation of the maximum of Y and its independent copy. And there are also possibilities to avoid independent copies, but I will not go into details here. So uh, just to summarize what we do, we'll uh, minimize according to all possible lambda, the following functional. So this part comes from the uh, uh, excursion metric. And this part comes from the attempt to do it uh, law preservingly, to make a law preserving uh, prediction. And uh, this is just an optimization problem, which is in general not convex, 
and um, of course not linear. So it is a kind of an effort to show that the solution exists and we did it. So the results are available under some specific uh, assumptions uh, on continuity and on the compactness of lambda and so on. Uh, the uniqueness, however, can be proven only depending on the class of distributions which are considered. So it is impossible to do it for all possible random variables because we are in very uh, great generality. So in these generalities, it's just uh, nonsense. And a numerical solution of that can be given by whatever uh, decent minim minimization method we just implemented one of them, the stochastic subgradient descent, which is quite um, fast and gives nice results. So now let me illustrate this uh, on uh, stationary random fields. Just to repeat our uh, setting, we have a certain predictor, which is a measurable function of observations. The observations are, giving, are given uh, using this particular sample. And lambda is the vector of weights which has to be optimized. So we solve the optimization problem, which is given this way. And this is the mean um, uh, of the um, integrated over all levels um, length of the um, symmetric difference of level sets level sets of x and of its predictor. And we assume that we have this um, uh, law preserving property. So just this was to remind you what we are doing. And uh, as I said, by Fubini theorem, you can uh, reduce it to the solution of this one. So we do not integrate over uh, t anymore. So t is fixed. So we have no observation window. This is for each t. And for um, Gaussian random processes and fields, this is a very tractable and easy to solve problem. So now we assume X to be a stationary measurable Gaussian random field with a certain expectation mu, which we uh, assume to be unknown. And uh, with the covariance function C uh, given this way. So sigma square is the variance, which is assumed to be positive. So our field is not trivial. The prediction is linear because uh, Gauss and Brenner fields are infinitely divisible. And um, so for simplicity, we will also need the, to, to denote by uh, uh, sigma, capital sigma, the covariance matrix of our observations. And we assume that it is positive semi-definite. So C of T will be the vector of covariances uh, between the unknown observation and the known locations T1 up to Tn. And E just the vector of ones. So using this notation, we may formulate the above problem in a very simple and geometrically tractable way under the assumption that mu is unknown. Our law preserving excursion prediction for Gaussian case reads as follows. So we have a linear programming problem here, but which is subject to two constraints. And one of them is the so-called ellipsoid constraint, which stems from the uh, property that the variance of the prediction must be equal to sigma squared. And the second one is a linear constraint, which stems from the condition that we have to preserve the mean. You know that uh, Gaussian random process are governed by these two properties. That's why we are done. And this uh, programming is actually in literature called a second order cone programming. And uh, the geometric interpretation is quite clear. So we have the uh, ellipsoid, uh, the constraint ellipsoid, uh, which is given this way. And we have the simplex, which is, which is our linear constraint. And um, uh, the lambdas can be uh, just taken from the, um, from the uh, intersection of those two. And we then minimize the value of the cosine of the angle between the vector C of T and lambda. 
This is in the case of unknown mu, and if mu is uh, taken to be known, that we do not need the linear constraint, and then we'll have only the ellipsoid constraint. So this is a very easy geometric interpretation, and we can uh, start formulating the solution. So under the assumptions that CT is not collinear to E, which means that um, the kind of um, dependence between XT and XTJ is not uniform. So, and if we have no IID observations under the condition that sigma is non-degenerate, positive definite, then there exists a unique solution lambda to our minimization problem. And the solution is exact, which means that at the observation points, our uh, extrapolated curve goes through the observation points. So this is uh, a result. And then of course we can give in this specific case, the mean square error of the prediction, uh, just to, to be noticed, this particular thing is possible only in the Gaussian case because we have no heavy tails, right? And uh, um, so this formula, are, uh, they are uh, easily tractable, but I will not go into details now because I think I'm running out of time. Let me just go further and say that uh, we have under the assumption that the covariance function is continuous and positively definite, we have also the so-called consistency, which means if uh, the uh, set of our observations becomes dense uh, and depends on n, so uh, we have a dense lattice, then we have a convergence of our prediction to the uh, unknown value in L2 sense, for instance, or even almost surely, but for the almost sure convergence, we'll also need uh, additional assumptions like C must be held a continuous, um, with index alpha and the mesh sizes of the lattices must converge to zero in a very fast way and so on. But this is good news. So we have uh, very nice consistency results which are desirable. And now uh, at the end of my talk, let me just give you the uh, corresponding uh, simulations. We'll consider a stationary Gaussian process with a uh, mu with the mean zero and unit variance, we'll simulate it on an interval from zero to 100 and measure it at some points, which with uh, uh, step size h. Um, and we'll perform it for two covariance functions for the exponential one, which produces very rough trajectories, and for a Gaussian one, which produces very smooth trajectories. And this is uh, the result for the uh, computation for just 10 observations. So 10 observations out of 100 is very, very few. And you see that for the Gaussian covariance, we have uh, quite nice uh, uh, results. But for the exponential covariance, the number of observations 10 is uh, surely not sufficient. And then if we increase the number of observations, so uh, we uh, observe it at each of the values, or we observe it even uh, with the start, step size 0 0.2, then our results become better and better, which is in accordance with um, the uh, property of continuity or um, um, what, what I was saying before. Let me just go back. This consistency property is exactly this, yeah. Okay. And uh, now the last slide will be about the comparison between different methods. Now we can do the following. We can uh, extrapolate the Gaussian process, which is in blue, with the Gaussian covariance um, uh, using the following methods. Um, the simple Kriegen, which is in red, ordinary Kriegen, which is in yellow, and our method, which uh, uh, assumes uh, the mean to be known, in orange or unknown in green. And you see that our method differs from uh, the simple Kriegen and ordinary Kriegen. Uh, and this is understandable because we have actually the law preserving prediction. Well, I will uh, like to conclude with the list of references. So uh, what I was telling you now is based on these 
two papers. The first one is the paper uh, which was uh, published last year. Uh, well, this year, but it was uh, submitted last year. And another one is a very new one, which is already submitted. Uh, and this one um, handles the more general situation of prediction by excursion metric. And the corresponding R software for Gaussian random processes is given here. Well, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Dear Professor Spodarev, thank you very much for your interesting and mathematically overloaded uh, talk. Uh, dear colleagues, we have 15 minutes to ask questions and get answers. You are welcome to be asking. Okay, mathematicians have no answers. I uh, sorry, uh, uh, questions, and uh, that is why I uh, allow me to ask uh, such a, a heavy tail functions. Uh, when I look at the real world situation, what in the behavior of this real world system should bring me to the idea that I should. Uh, try to use for modeling uh, such a specific uh, distribution functions, not Gaussian, not uniform, not yeah, I well, not uh, normal, but this one. Uh, these are random functions which have a, a very small probability of very high values. Uh, so the uh, very uh, classical um, uh, example is uh, the maximal. Um, dam height so for instance in the netherlands you need to project uh, to project dams and you need to somehow calculate the height of the dams so uh, that it is over flooded every 1000 years so it means an unusual high flood and the unusual high flood is a, a, a function which has heavy tails it means normally it fluctuates not so much but there is a small possibility of very high excursion and this high excursion is exactly what is important for us because uh, we need to construct a dam, right? This is one of the possibility and it is uh, uh, it, it comes from the extremal value theory. And uh, other possibilities uh, stem from uh, finance insurance. So uh, if you uh, look at the development of some uh, uh, prices of bonds and stocks, some of them are very highly volatile. And some of them have a small probability of very high excursions or very low excursions. And this is an, a, another indication that we have heavy tails. Uh, for example, uniform distribution is also heavy tailed. No, no, no. Uniform distribution is bounded. So uniform distribution is on the interval from A to B. And that's why yeah, yeah. I understand it bounded, but nevertheless, look uh, looks like a heavy tailed. No, no, no. A uniform distribution is perfectly light tailed because it is bounded. So any bounded distribution cannot be heavy tailed. Uh -huh. So uh, what is this? Log normal uh, <coughs> uh, distribution is something like to heavy tailed. Log normal, in my opinion, it is also not heavy tailed, uh, but for instance, if you consider Frisch distribution, Frisch is uh, heavy tailed. Mm -hmm. uh, if you consider alpha stable distribution, it is heavy tailed. And then a viable distribution for some parameters is heavy tailed and so on. So there are many possibilities, but actually if you take exponential to the power uh, uh, x squared over uh, four, I guess, and x squared is n01, the standard normal, then it is heavy tail. Mm -hmm. And more uh, one question, heavy tailed distribution can be also uh, non-symmetrical. Yes, sure. It, they must not, but they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Dear colleagues, who is ready to ask this next question? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Sure. 
Well, thank you very much for this possibility to ask a question. Uh, I'm not so smart to ask smart questions, but my question is, what are practical uh, applications of these researches? I mean, uh, where in life can we apply this uh, serious and interesting researches? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the possibilities is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the prediction of uh, bonds and stock prices. So mm -hmm. if you take financial mathematics, so people uh, can hardly predict prices. This is known due to many reasons. I do not say that we will do it much better than, than they, but still, uh, we propose a method which allows this to be done. This is the first possibility. Another possibility is the uh, climate data. So uh, if you look at precipitation data, uh, like uh, the maximal rain or the uh, maximal temperatures per day, uh, uh, according to some, some period, then it is also, uh, it uh, has a max stable behavior. And max stable means that sometimes the uh, uh, second moments cannot exist. And uh, this theory can be very nicely uh, applied to this particular situation. So climate data, environmental data, and uh, data from insurance and finance. This is the immediate application which I see now, but possibly there is more. As you know, like playing some, some, some uh, bets, Possibly, I mean, it, it, we have to look at the data. If, if you have a very small chance of very high or very low values, then it is indeed the case. But, uh, you know, this method is universal. You can apply it everywhere. Okay. But it was designed just uh, to cope with heavy tails. But it doesn't mean that you cannot just take a Gaussian random function and do it for Gaussians. You can do it everywhere. So it is uniform. It is uh, very general. So this is the um, advantage of our method compared to Krieging and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Dear colleagues, who is ready to ask? We have yet time. Okay, I have more one question about application uh, in uh, how to say modeling of social uh, systems. Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, where can we use this uh, approach? What do you mean by social systems? Can you be uh, uh, more... societies? <laughs> you no, mean not, not economy? Uh, you mean social statistics? For example behavior of big groups of humans well i mean everywhere where you need to predict a certain random function you can apply it and the, the question is what is your random function in your context um so it can be the prediction of some opinion polls of course but uh in opinion polls you have categorized random variables which means yes or no or uh, some answers from one to four, uh, from one to six, from one to 10. So these methods cannot be applied to categorize random variables. So we, we have to have uh, continuous uh, values. So mm -hmm. in this sense, if you say that you have some opinion polls, it cannot be used directly. But if you have a random variable, which is somehow, um, produced by uh, social statistics, but is continuously distributed, then it can be applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did not catch that it cannot be categorical. Yeah, but uh, in our, Before. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we had an assumption that our CDF is absolutely continuously distributed. Oh. So we cannot consider discrete random variables for uh, many reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, our pseudo metric will be not a metric. So if it is equal to zero, it will not uh, mean uh, that we have the coincidence of distributions. So this is the main reason. So for discrete random variables, we have to develop a different theory. Yeah, understand. 
Mm -hmm. I realize it now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. If nobody would like to ask any question, is it so? Dear Professor Spodrev, thank you very much for your interesting talk and interesting discussion after your presentation. And you are welcome to join us, Fuser. Thank you very much. Oh.